Jinke. If I could request everyone to stand, I would like to welcome our Dean Yang Berusaha, Professor Dr. April Kamila Roslani, and our Lady of Honor, Yang Berusaha, Professor Dr. Mazida Mansur. 
Please remain standing in attention as we play the national anthem and the University Malaya song. If I may invite both Professor April and Professor Mazida to take a seat. Ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. A very good afternoon to Yang Berusaha, Professor Dr. April Kamila Roslani, Dean, Faculty of Medicine, University Malaya. Yang Berusaha, Professor Dr. Mazida Mansur, distinguished guests, Professor Mazida's family and friends, fellow professors, academicians, doctors, researchers, and colleagues. It is my great honor to welcome everyone to the inaugural lecture by our esteemed colleague and my beloved mentor, Professor Dr. Mazida Mansur, PIMP, Pain Medicine, Progress and New Challenges. A professor's inaugural lecture is a cherished tradition of University Malaya. It serves as a platform for the professors to share their philosophies, perspective, and also new ideas in their expert field. Professor Mazida achieved a significant milestone in her academic career as a professor of anesthesiology. And today, remarks 14 remarkable years of accomplishment in the field of pain medicine and cardiothoracic anesthesia. Before we begin to share, uh, before we begin, okay, I'm going to share with you a short poem that echoes Professor Mazida's passion 
and care for her patients as a pain consultant. I can't make it stop hurting, not take away the pain completely. But I can sit and listen, so I'll be here all the same. Then when you need to let it out, to let your tears run free, feel my arms around your shoulder and let it rain on me. It is now with great pleasure I would like to invite the Dean of the Faculty of Medicine, Professor Dr. April Kamila Roslani, to chair the lecture and introduce Professor Dr. Mazida Mansur. Please welcome Professor Dr. April. Honorable Professor Dr. Mazida Manso, Professor of Anesthesiology here at Faculty of Medicine, University of Malaya, distinguished guests, colleagues, ladies, and gentlemen, Assalamu alaikum and salam sejahtera, as well as greetings to you, whether you are joining us here in the TJ Danaraj Auditorium or online. There is a saying that pain is inevitable but suffering is optional. Our inaugural lecturer today is someone who has made her life's work that of reducing suffering due to pain, whether physical or otherwise. Professor Mazida Manso is a professor and consultant anesthesiologist in the Department of Anesthesiology here at Faculty of Medicine, University of Malaya. However, her earliest uh, degrees were from the University of Kebangsaan, Malaysia, where she graduated uh, from the medical school in 1988. Following that, however, she was recruited into University of Malaya's academic staff training scheme in 1991 as a trainee in anesthesiology, whereupon she completed the Master of Anesthesiology in 1995 and was one of the pioneers in Malaysia to develop skills in cardiac anesthesia at the National Heart Institute in 1997. It became apparent to Professor Mazida at this juncture, however, through her long-term interactions with her patients, that traditional anesthesiology primarily focused on short-term pain control. To address the gap in the management of chronic pain, she undertook a fellowship in pain management at the Royal North Shore Hospital in Sydney, Australia, from 2004 to 2005. In an approach demonstrating out-of-the-box thinking, she decided then to learn hypnosis, knowing that it can suppress the brain's perception of pain. She obtained certification in hypnoanesthesia and hypnosedation from the London College of Clinical Hypnosis Asia in 2019 and has since been practicing as professor and consultant in both cardiac anesthesia as well as pain at University of Malaya Medical Center as well as University of Malaya Specialist Center. As an academic, Professor Mazida's research interests are in acute, chronic and cancer pain management, cardiothoracic anesthesia, critical care, clinical pharmacology and clinical hypnosis. Her main research area is on the role of immunomodulators in the treatment of sepsis and pain. However, she has very diverse research interests, and these include the role of music in reducing pain in the operating theatre, audit on outcomes of acute postoperative pain management and neuromodulation in the treatment of chronic neuropathic pain. She has been an invited speaker at many national and international conferences and has published 56 scientific publications in both peer-reviewed journals as well as books. In addition to all of these roles, she is the editor, particularly for the pain section, in the Malaysian Journal of Anesthesiology, an editorial member of the Journal of Indian College of Anesthesiologists, and is on the editorial board of Cardiothoracic Anesthesiology section for Frontiers in Anesthesiology. She serves as a copy editor, interestingly enough, for the Malaysian Orthopedics Journal. In addition to this, Professor Mazida has taken on many leadership roles. 
during her unprecedented 11-year tenure as head of anesthesiology here at University of Malaya, she was instrumental in developing the pre-anesthetic clinic and overseeing the renovation of the main operating theatre. The development of the new operating theatre complexes in both Manara Slatan as well as the women and children's complex. She has also played a major role in the expansion of the intensive care unit. Other important roles are that of President of the Malaysian Society of Anesthesiologists during the particularly challenging time of the COVID-19 pandemic. In addition to guiding the development of COVID-19 related anesthetic guidelines and releasing relevant press statements, Professor Mazida also took on the challenge of organising the first virtual MSA College of Anesthesiologists annual scientific congress which was a great success. Currently, she is president for the College of Anesthesiologists at the Academy of Medicine of Malaysia and is passionate about championing the well-being of anesthesiologists as well as sustainability in anesthesia. Further to this, as convener of the Pain Special Interest Group, she actively organizes educational activities in this area and is a strong advocate for pain medicine to be recognized as a subspecialty of anesthesiology. Through her other roles in the Malaysian Association for the Study of Pain and the Malaysian Society of Interventional Pain Practitioners, she has helped develop Malaysian guidelines for the management of both neuropathic pain, low back pain, as well as cancer pain. On a personal note, Professor Mazida um, has been someone that I have looked up to. Uh, I am a colorectal surgeon, um, so I'm not an anesthetist, but I have always appreciated our anesthesiology colleagues who have supported us to allow us to achieve our uh, goals for our patient. But I think beyond her expertise in her area, I think she has really impressed upon us how much value she brings as both a mentor, a supporter, and a friend to both colleagues at the same level, as well as those that are developing in their skills. I think with this background, it is clear to all of us that Professor Mazida is very, very well placed to deliver her inaugural lecture on the topic of pain medicine, progress, and new challenges. Please join me in welcoming Professor Mazida. Thank you very much, Professor April, for that very kind introduction. Yang berusaha, Professor April Camilla Ruslaini, Dean, Faculty of Medicine, distinguished guests, professors, students, and fellow colleagues. Thank you very much for being here today. And I would like to say good evening, assalamualaikum, and selamat sejahtera. I've been asked to remove my mask. <laughs> uh, I would like to again uh, thank everyone for being here today, uh, either here in the hall or uh, streaming live on the YouTube and um, when I just want to begin by uh, telling you a story about how when I was young I was asked uh, by a friend of mine to have my palm read and the when the person who, who was reading my palm said that I probably uh, is destined to work with a machine. So I asked him, uh, what kind of machine? But he couldn't elaborate about the machine. But now I know it is the anesthetic machine. <laughs> yes, I am an anesthesiologist. And once I realized that uh, my calling is anesthesiology, and um, I begin to be uh, 
interested in um, uh, cardiac anesthesia. And um, as an uh, anesthesiologist, uh, we are medical doctors who specialize in anesthesia, pain management, critical, and critical care medicine. But while our physician anesthesiologists know how to treat pain, but some will choose to specialize in pain medicine and are especially skilled and experienced in taking care of people with chronic pain. But like I told you, I was initially interested in cardiothoracic anesthesia and went to IGN for training. And as much as uh, I was very impressed with the high technology involved with open heart surgery and the complexity of minimally invasive cardiac surgery, uh, vascular and thoracic surgery, I was actually more in intrigued with pain medicine. So I finally decided to do uh, pain medicine, and the reason being is because I'm missing the patient-doctor interaction that comes with the long-term care and missing the challenges of diagnostic evaluation. Furthermore, I would like to be an all-rounder physician and contribute to treating acute chronic and cancer pain patients as well. I would also like to be an independent clinician uh, and would like someday to have my own uh, clinics or own business. The specialty of pain medicine is a discipline with the field of medicine that is concerned with prevention of pain and the evaluation, treatment, and rehabilitation of persons in pain. It was pioneered by anesthesiologists. And although the specialty is relatively new, there have been a considerable progress and new challenges noted in the last four decades that will be highlighted in this uh, lecture. The global burden of disease study in 2016 suggested that pain-related rela diseases are the leading cause of disability and disease burden globally. And the last two decades have seen an explosive growth in the scientific study of pain and anesthesiologists taking up pain medicine as a career. Then I then uh, make a journey to Australia to work under the supervision of Professor Michael Cousins, who is the founding dean of the Faculty of Medicine at the Australia and New Zealand College of Anesthesiologists. He is also the head of Pain Management and Research Centre at the Royal North Shore uh, Hospital, University of Sydney, where I did my fellowship in pain management. And Professor Cousin uh, was trained in America and Canada by pioneers in pain medicine, such as uh, uh, Professor J. Bonica, who is the founding father of the dis discipline of pain medicine, and also working with uh, uh, Professor Ronald Malzak and Patrick Wall, who published a paper outlining the gate control theory of pain in 1965. The lesson that I learned from Australia is that a majority of the patient there with severe intractable pain uh, and when they are resistant to conventional pain management, they were mainly treated with intratical pumps loaded with pain medication or spinal cord stimulator. However, as I found out, that similar treatment cannot be done in Malaysia because, I mean, not easily done in Malaysia because these treatments are way too expensive and these interventions are not covered by insurance companies. But one of the most valuable skills that I have learned is that there is, uh, I learned about multidisciplinary pain management and or what are the characteristics of a multidisciplinary pain centre. And I've also learned extensively about the psychological aspect of pain management and about pain management programme. 
and these have helped me till today. And I was also exposed to fundamental and clinical research. And we all know about the importance of a new discovery in modern medicine. So these are the intrathecal pumps and the spinal cord stimulators that's used commonly in a Western country for intractable pain. In 2021, the Nobel Prize in Physiology or uh, medicine was jointly given to David Julius and Adam Pataputian for their discovery of receptors for temperature and touch. David Julius used capsaicin from, cell, uh, from chili peppers to identify TRP1, an ion channel activated by painful heat. And he later found additional ion channels and this is how we become to understand how different temperatures uh, can induce electrical sickness in the nervous system. Pataputian used cultured mechanosensitive cells to identify an ion channel activated by mechanical force. And after a painstaking work, piezo-1 was identified and subsequently piezo-2. The important discoveries explain how heat, cold, and touch can initiate signals in our nervous system. The identified ion channels are important for many physiological processes and disease condition. So this knowledge is now being used to develop treatments for a wide range of disease condition, including chronic pain. So the two scientists have enabled us to enjoy the hugs that we miss so much during this pandemic. As soon as, as I returned to Malaysia, I was introduced to a group of scientists by Professor Gracie Ong, uh, and who wanted to conduct a study on analgesic property of honey, or galam honey to be specific. Our group investigated the effects of honey and its methanol and ethyl acetate extracts on inflammation in animal model. We were lucky to receive two FRGS grants to conduct this study on animal model. So in this study, red spores were induced with carrageenan in the non-immune inflammatory and nociceptive model and lipopolysaccharide or LPS in the immune inflammatory model. Honey and its extracts were able to inhibit edema and pain in inflammatory tissues as well as showing potent inhibitory activities against nitric oxide and prostaglandin E2 in both models. And the decrease in edema and pain correlates with the inhibition of nitric oxide and prostaglandin E2 was seen and phenolic compounds have been implicated in the inhibitory activities. So we concluded that honey is potentially useful in the treatment of inflammatory conditions. And then we also investigate the anti-nociceptive test of uh, honey. And this uh, uh, graph is showing uh, how the withdrawal latency period of, of uh, the red spore uh, and the, it was withdrawn when, when uh, subjected to infrared light in, in the pore injected with normal saline. And the latency is much less when it's given injected with endomethacin, but it's even more less when it's injected with honey and uh, honey extracts. Subsequently, we published more papers to show the mechanism of action uh, of uh, the honey. And we also showed that galam honey has a protective effect against uh, LPS-induced organ failure. This is a study where we divide the rabbits into three groups, control groups, treatment group with galam honey, and the uh, non-treatment group. And we subjected the blood uh, of the rabbit 
to um, to uh, to see some biochemistry results, and we found that uh, there is uh, organ protection in the uh, in the group with treated with honey. For instance, the the normal urea in this rabbit is 5.85, but is in the untreated rabbits it was 55.85, and in the honey treated the urea was 10.5. So it's, it is sig significantly uh, uh, been shown that uh, there is protection of organ damage with the use of honey. When we subject uh, the rabbit's lung to histopathology, uh, this is the normal lung. This is lung treated with honey. And then this is the lung treated, uh, not treated, and uh, not treated with honey. So we can see that uh, the immune cell infiltration and tissue damage in the lungs of rabbits uh, is a lot more with uh, uh, rabbits that's not treated with honey. In terms of survival rate, it has been shown that um, the survival rate is much higher with rabbits that's treated with honey. The Kaplan-Meier analysis showed significantly better survival rates in the honey-treated group with P less than 0.005. And this fundamental study resulted with a few PhD candidates and, um, and we were very proud of that. Regarding the history of pain medicine, in the 1600, many European doctors gave their pa patient opium to relieve pain. But by the 1800, ether and chloroform were introduced as anesthetics for surgery. So World Anesthesia Day is celebrated to commemorate the first successful demonstration of diethyl ether anesthesia in 1846. This day celebrates the discovery of anesthesia, which made it possible for patients to undergo surgical, pro surgical procedures without any physical pain. And this is one of the best discovery of modern medicine. By the 1900s, morphine and heroin came into use as pain medications. For a short period, opioid seems to be the answer to the long-standing problem of how to relieve pain without putting patients at high risk of addiction. Turns out, that was a wishful thinking. And of late, the topic of pain management has been much discussed in medicine because of opioid crisis. Formation of pain as a field of medical medicine began in 1960s, and by the 1970s, the field had a dedicated research journal, the Pain Journal, and the formation of association, which is the International Association for the Study of Pain. In Malaysia, we have Malaysian Association for the Study of Pain, a chapter of International Association of Study of Pain, Malaysian Society of Interventional Pain Practitioner, a chapter of World Institute of Pain, and Pain Special Interest Group in College of Anesthesiologists Academy of Medicine, Malaysia. And I have the opportunity to work with three presidents of MASP, which is Professor Alex Delikan, Professor Ramani Vijayan, and Dr. Mary Cardosa, who are also giants in pain management in Malaysia. Dato Dr. Alex Delikan set up the first pain clinic in Malaysia, and Professor Ramani Vijayan set up the first acute pain service in Malaysia, and Dr. Mary Cardosa was influential in the, uh, uh, creating awareness about pain by uh, launching the uh, pain as the fifth vital sign and the free pain hospital in the Ministry of Health. 
While working with them, I was fortunate to develop four Malaysian guidelines on pain, which is the Malaysian low back pain management guidelines, the management of neuropathic pain, clinical practice guidelines on the management of cancer pain in collaboration of Ministry of Health, and a guide to the use of strong opioids in chronic non-cancer pain. Pain can be categorized as nociceptive, which is pain that is arising from tissue injury, or neuropathic, pain arising from nerve injury, or nociplastic, pain arising from a sensitized nervous system. It can also be classified as acute or chronic pain, and chronic pain can be further divided into chronic non-cancer and chronic cancer pain. This is the pain mechanism model from Gifford, highlighting that once the danger detected by sensory nerves from both our environment and our tissue are sent up to the spinal cord and to the brain, the brain and spinal cord will assess the incoming signals and produce an appropriate output to adapt to remain as safe as possible. If it suspect we are in danger, it produces an output depending on whether we need to protect ourselves, uh, such as moving away from danger or feel pain in those tissues so that we stop using them. The increase of our understanding regarding pain mechanism and advances in basic and clinical research have expanded the options of drugs that can be used to treat pain. And the analgesic medication can be divided into three broad categories, which is non-opioid analgesic, such as acetaminophen, NSAIDs, and COX-2 inhibitors, opioid analgesic, such as tramadol, morphine, or fentanyl, adjuvant analgesics, which are drugs that have primary indications other than pain, but may be uh, an analgesic in selected circumstances. And the example is antidepressant, anticonvulsants, local anesthetics, corticosteroids, alpha-2 agonists, uh, NMDA antagonists, and biphosphonates. This is uh, a diagram showing the location of action of these drugs in the nervous system for analgesics used in the multimodal therapy. So what are some of the progress in uh, pain medicine? So I would consider a systematic classification of pain in the ICD-11 as progress. Advances in pain science recognize that pain can be a disease when it becomes chronic. It is not just a symptom, which resulted in the development of a classification system for chronic pain that has been implemented in the International Classification of Diseases 11th Revision. And it is uh, supposed to be released this year. And among the major innovations induced in the updated ICD-11 is a systematic classification of clinical conditions associated with chronic pain. So this is the first time pain is being properly documented and coded. So ICD-11 has taken a decisive step to be better reflect the significance of chronic pain as a health problem of enormous epidemiological, economic, and sociological impact. Chronic pain is pain that is persistent and lasts for more than three months. And pain, chronic pain can be secondary, that is caused by underlying conditions, such as, for example, osteoarthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, ulcerative colitis, or endometriosis. But chronic pain can also be primary. And chronic primary pain has no clear underlying condition, or the pain or its impacts appears to be out of proportion to any observable injury or disease. ICD-11 has given examples of chronic primary pain, which include fibromyalgia, which is a chronic widespread pain, complex regional pain syndrome, chronic primary headache and orofacial, chronic primary visceral pain, 
and chronic primary musculoskeletal pain. And the chronic neuropathic pain is further divided into chronic peripheral neuropathic pain and chronic central neuropathic pain. Example of chronic peripheral neuropathic pain include trigeminal neuralgia, chronic neuropathic pain after peripheral nerve injury, painful, poly, painful polyneuropathy, post-hepatic neuralgia, and painful radiculopathy. While chronic central neuropathic pain include pain such as uh, chronic central neuropathic pain and pain associated with spinal cord injury or with brain injury or post-stroke pain or uh, chronic central neuropathic pain associated with uh, multiple sclerosis. NICE uh, guidelines or is a guidelines which are evidence-based uh, recommendations for health and care in England and they have come out with a guideline uh, on chronic pain. This uh, guideline recommends a person-centered approach in assessment of chronic pain. However, the guideline only made the following recommendation for the management of chronic primary pain, not secondary pain, yeah? primary pain, and where they recommend exercise program and physical therapy, psychological therapy, acupuncture, and pharmacological management, mainly antidepressants such as uh, amitriptyline and duloxetine. The other progress in pain medicine, I would say, is the revision of the definition of pain by IASP. Now, the definition of pain is that pain is an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with or resembling that, that associated with actual or potential tissue damage. The ISP definition of pain was revised in 2020 to encompass advances in pain science that have occurred in the last four decades since the definition was first adopted in 1979. These advances include knowledge of the neuroplastic nature of pain across the peripheral and central nervous system, relationship of pain with the psychosocial factor, advances in pain assessment beyond verbal descriptors. Just because someone could not describe pain, that doesn't mean that they are not in pain. And the impact of pain on the individual. Because they recognize that chronic pain can, be, uh, can cause patients to suffer. Other progress in pain include devices to me measure nociception. And, and for a long time, we have been using blood pressure, uh, uh, heart rate, and pupil diameter to, to measure uh, the effect of nociception on autonomic function. And there's also a technology that measures the parasympathetic tone to continuously evaluate the patient's comfort level. And this um, method of measuring nociception uh, will be useful in a situation where communication is impaired, such as in patients under anesthesia or in critical care condition. However, there's still a need for rigorous evaluation of such devices in relevant clinical settings before its widespread use. There are some new challenges that we are facing in pain medicine and one of it in the management of acute pain. The increasing number of patients presenting for surgery who are already on a strong opioid creates challenges for acute pain management. Buprenorphine used for chronic pain and, and increasingly, increasingly for opioid replacement therapy is a partial agonist with concerns about sealing analgesic effects. Some clinical key recommendation has been developed and 
they suggested to continue buprenorphine throughout the perioperative period with careful consideration of discharge planning. And longer term problems may be prevented by the continued review and assessment of all patients on strong opioid after surgery. In the management of acute pain in the post-operative period, it is not just about a specific pain score, but more importantly, the goal of any pain therapy should be the ability to improve the perioperative outcome and ambulation. Therefore, it's been suggested that post-op pain uh, management should include uh, multimodal analgesic techniques, minimize the use of opioid, increase the use of non-opioid agents, and the use of regional anesthesia whenever possible, and the use of evidence-based procedure specific pain management guidelines where available. This is the acute pain service in UMMC. We have a dedicated room where we keep all the patient control energy, their pumps, uh, and all the audits and uh, uh, in this room. And these are the nurses who are specifically involved in the uh, management of uh, acute, uh, acute pain, where they do rounds in the wards and also look after uh, uh, patient perioperatively. But what are some of the challenges faced by our acute pain service in UMMC? So in UMMC, we have been consistently conducting studies and audit to ensure that post-operative patients receive the highest standard of care for their pain. Because poorly managed acute post-op pain can impede recovery, increase the risk of physiological and psychological complication developing in the immediate post-operative period. It can also prolong the duration of hospital stay and increase opioid use and opioid dependence. So increase, it can also increase the risk of developing chronic pain in the months after surgery and in the long term reduce the quality of life. So we conduct a study uh, where we uh, use a, a, a new protocol for the acute pain uh, uh, service to use. This is because although we have done a lot for acute pain service, but the pain experienced by patient post-operatively is still significant. So we embark on this study where we divided 60 patients into two groups, one with the new protocol and one with the existing protocol. And the new protocol include the preoperative patient education perioperative pain management planning, multimodal analgesia techniques intraoperatively and postoperatively, and regular assessment of pain in the ward as well as assessment of patient reported outcome after surgery via patient outcome questionnaires. And data from the study was entered into pain out registry, which is used throughout the world as a benchmark for post-op uh, pain outcome. Because, by, because we need to compare uh, our outcome uh, with the rest of the world. So with the implementation of a protocol compared to the baseline audit done in UMMC, some improvements were seen. For instance, intraoperatively, more patients receive peripheral nerve blocks for analgesia and many receive a wider range of non-opioids. And we also see the decline in uh, the use of epidural analgesia. In the recovery room, fewer patients requ required rescue analgesia with a reduction from more than 50% to 50% to 40%. In the ward, all patients received non-opioid analgesia and more patients from 50 to 66 
receive a form of opioid analgesia in which 23% receive patient control analgesia. Patient outcome after surgery improved with a reduction in maximum pain score from 5.82 to 4.75 and duration in severe pain reduced from 42% to 19%. The results also showed a reduction from 42% to 11% of patients who would like for more pain treatment than received. Patients' average satisfaction score in pain management, uh, uh, the average satisfaction score improved from 7.4 to 9.1, almost 10. This is a graph showing how epidural analgesia trend in UMMC is coming down, but we couldn't record the increase in the use of peripheral nerve blocks so due to poor documentation. Therefore, the regional anesthesia team has come up with these plans for improvement from the, uh, to, to actually capture the data and to make sure that the peripheral uh, the practice of peripheral nerve blocks uh, are safe. So this include giving the patient information leaflet about uh, regional anesthesia, and there was SOP or work processes uh, involved with uh, the management of local anesthetic systemic toxicity. There's also SOP for how to optimize block success, and SOP for management of perioperative nerve injury. And there was a standardized post-op orders after peripheral nerve blocks or neuroaxial blocks using stamps to make it easier. There was also a regional corner trolley uh, and here needles, probe cover, gels and blue phantom for, for a practice uh, were placed. Plus there were medias to be pasted on the walls at the regional corner. Training is very important, and I would like to uh, thank Dr. Bay, uh, Dr. Lim Siu Ming, and Lim Mulai, and many others who have been uh, very dedicated and involved in the training of regional anesthesia, and, uh, and they do it uh, by having this pain medicine rotation posting, which will include uh, rotation description, syllabus assessment, and a likely end of posting exam uh, using questions from Europe, uh, EDRA. So there was also an in-house regional anesthesia cadaveric workshop training in collaboration with Silent Mentor and continuous audit using the red cap peripheral nerve block registry. Another concept that is increasingly be, being adopted by our surgical colleagues is enhanced recovery after surgery. So enhanced recovery after surgery is a surgical protocol that streamlines patient processes before, during, and after surgeries. And the program aims to shorten the length of stay for patients and facilitate early mobility and recovery while improving outcomes and patients' overall experiences. So in, uh, here I would like to share uh, a case uh, where an enhanced recovery after thoracic surgery protocol was used. This is a 72-year-old Chinese man diagnosed with adenocarcinoma of the upper lobe of the right lung and scheduled for a right upper lobe lobectomy. He was immediately referred as part of the protocol to the chest physiotherapy and treatment given which include uh, encouraging the patient to ambulate before and after operation. And uh, pain management is an important part of ensuring the success of ERAS. And in terms of uh, surgery, the tumor was removed via a uniportal video assisted thoracoscopy and not by uh, a conventional uh, thoracotomy. And 
this result with a very small wound and only one small chest drain was inserted for this patient to reduce pain. For pain management, we are using the multimodal opioid sparing uh, method. And instead of using epidural, we are using paravertebral block given under direct vision by the surgeon or intercostal nerve blocks and wound infiltration with local anesthetic. So the outcome of the ERATS. On the first post-op day, the patient is already taking orally and doing his breathing exercise and his urinary catheter was removed. In the afternoon, he was sitting up in a chair, ready to be transferred back to the ward. And on the post-op day two, his chest drain was removed. And after two days in the ward, he was discharged well on the fourth post-op day. This is a lot more shorter hospital stay compared to the seven days of if he were to had the conventional method. Cognitive behavioral interventions can also be used for acute pain. Reassurance and provision of information. There's some evidence that information is effective in reducing procedure-related pain in tentative and tentatively supportive, but it's not sufficient to make a recommendations. Relaxation training, uh, the evidence is weak. For attentional techniques such as imagery, distraction, and music therapy, there's some evidence that listening to music produces a small reduction in post-operative pain and opioid recurrent, and immersive virtual reality dis distraction is effective in reducing pain in some clinical situation. For hypnosis, the benefit in acute pain uh, is still inconsistent. Coping methods such as behavioral instruction, it has been shown that training prior to surgery reduces pain, negative effect, and analgesic effect. This is a research that we have done in UMMC to look at the effect of listening to music in reducing anxiety for regional anesthesia cases. The increase in anxiety level is a serious issue in regional anesthesia cases, and this is due to the patients being aware of the operation, thus making them to hear sounds from operating equipment, drilling, and as well as conversations between surgeons. So the research was conducted at the orthopedic operation theater, and the main aim of this research was to assess the effect of music therapy on reducing anxiety and the effect on the uh, blood pressures. This is how it will look like uh, uh, intraoperatively. And the results showed that for the music group uh, and the non-music group both showed a reduction in anxiety level. Uh, um, no, uh, for the music group, it shows reduc reduction of anxiety a level according to uh, VAS from 3.73 to 0 0.36. And for no music, the reduction is uh, much less. And for uh, the music group, there was a reduction in the mean diastolic pressure from 73 to 69. And for the one without music, there was increase in the uh, diastolic, mean diastolic blood pressure. And this was significantly, uh, it was, the difference is significant. So this study indicates that there was a significant difference in the mean of diastolic blood pressure within no music and music group based on the time. So with P less than 0 0.001. So music is safe. Uh, non-pharmacologic option uh, to enhance a patient's perioperative experience. It can be used as an adjunct to minimize or replace medication in certain points of perioperative period, such as 
in the elderly or sick patient that you wouldn't want to give uh, any medications because you may say, have you not, not heard of midazolam or have you had not heard of uh, TCI propofol? But there are pa patients who, who can be allergic to these drugs or just refuse to have these drugs. Or you as an anesthetist may not want to give them all those drugs. So allowing patients to listen to music via headphone throughout the perioperative setting gives them a sense of autonomy in a vulnerable period in their life and can be a simple, relatively cheap solution to incorporate in a perioperative practice. So this is the paper that we published with that uh, study. And what about hypnotherapy? Uh, there's there is increasing evidence that words and the power of suggestion uh, can be used to address pain. So let's look at this uh, video. Thank you for agreeing to do this interview with us. Okay. And so, um, your mom was, uh, did she have fear for uh, an upcoming surgery, and that was a while ago, and you brought her for hypnotherapy to address the fear of the surgery. And what was your experience for you uh, bringing mom for hypnotherapy? She had a bad experience at, in, in a... a medical situation so um, she thought that she wanted to try hypnotherapy and uh, she was very confident in it so um, that makes a difference you know I felt really good and under this and I felt very calm and I did not have any pain I could feel the doctor moving about doing things but it was very good and it was very comforting also having uh, Professor Marisa next to me, guiding me. That was really great, yes. So, Dr. Yeah. you yeah. were the surgeon that uh, uh, operated on Bridget. Huh? Yeah. And uh, how was the experience operating on a patient going under hypno-sedation, yeah, huh? you know, as compared to your usual cases of the LA? I think the patient is calmer, all right, and uh, it's more under control. Um, it is more calm when we do the procedure. No, I think not only the patient, but we also is a lot more calmer in the sense that we, because uh, we need the patient to be in calm situation. So even the surgeon has to be in a, you know, slightly <laughs> relaxed, you know, mm -hmm. not uh, um, expediting things unnecessarily. Mm -hmm. What was the experience like for you as you went through this? Uh, I think it's uh, um, I think it's a, a new experience in the sense that uh, I can foresee there's other modalities of how to um, uh, uh, treat patients in the sense that uh, and, uh, in the sense because usually we just employ either sedation or general anesthesia, anesthesia or uh, local anesthetic. But I think uh, hypnotherapy is a is a good adjunct in a sense, and, and I think it's uh, one of uh, a, a, a one way to about to move forward like in patient in, in, in uh, giving some sort of uh, 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 what do you call that? P pain uh, control during uh, surgery. Yes. I myself initially a bit skeptical whether it's going to work or not but when I actually did it, it was the result was amazing and I attribute it to the fact that uh, there was uh, adequate preparation uh, and correct selection of patient as well. And I, I, I was amazed at how easy it was for me to actually administer the hypnosedation, even though that was my first time doing it on in the operation theatre, because I usually do it in the pain clinic for a chronic pain patient. This is the first time I'm using it as hypnosedation. Uh, and, and the result was amazing, yeah. Because of this memory of that previous surgery, um, when you knew you had an upcoming surgery, 
uh, you became very fearful and that was before you know any hypnosis was administered um, and after when hypnosis was administered um, there was more confidence there was more more calmness to face the surgery uh, how did hypnosis help to change to make the fear go away I don't know. Somehow it, you just had the confidence to face it that it would be okay, you know. It was not like before you sort of anticipate pain, you anticipate, you know, it's going to be a long time. And this time there was none of that. I anticipated it to be good and not have any pain or very little. So it was very different. So this was a complete difference. So I was quite shocked. I was amazed, actually amazed. I would use the word. And my friend sat at home. She walked around the garden. I thought, wow, <laughs> what happened? This was on the day or surgery? On the day itself, you know? That was amazing. Normally, it's like, you have to help her walk slowly and walk, you know, have the care to look. But I knew that she would be able to look after herself. She would be able to feed herself and all that. Otherwise, I was already prepared, you know with uh, food delivery and things like right, that. Right, right, yeah. right. After the operation, uh, how much painkillers did you need to take? I take none. None at all? None at all. I hardly had any pain. There was a little bit of an ache, but it wasn't even like a headache, you know. It was very minor. So I did not really need any painkiller. And yeah. the next day, I have no pain ever since. What is your recommendation and opinion with regards to the use of hypnosis in anesthesiology and surgery? I think it is really a great thing to have it because it, re it prepares you to be less worried, you have no anticipation of coming pain and things like that. You can face it with confidence that it will be good and that you come through it, you know, quite happily. What is your advice to other patients going for surgery? I would say if you go for a local in particular, but even of a general, it's a good idea to have a course of clinical hypnosis because, you know, that will put you in a state of mind to face what's coming with, without fear. Yes, to have more confidence and not, have, not be worried about it. You know, people going for operation may think, oh no, what's going to happen? So if you have hypnosis, all that kind of fear will be gone. So uh, we are now leaving acute pain management and uh, going into chronic pain management. So this is the Advanced Pain and Rehabilitation Clinic in UMMC. Uh, first established uh, in 1980s and now it is a multidisciplinary advanced pain and rehabilitation clinic managed by anesthesiologist, a rehabilitation physician, neurosurgeon and interventional radiologist. Um, neuropathic pain treatment is a great challenge uh, to treat because the treatment of pain uh, of neuropathic pain is difficult and can cause patients to endure severe pain every day in their life. So I'm looking forward with optimism for more progress in pain medicine, medicine, especially in the search for the holy grail for the treatment of neuropathic pain. So in UMMC, this is our small contribution to trying to look for treatment for neuropathic pain, where we look at the inhibitory effects of biofeedback electrostimulation therapy on pain and cortisol levels in chronic neuropathic pain. And in this study, we use this gadget called BES. Uh, and it's a, a, something like a higher generation of TENS. Um, and after, then we look at the pain score and the cortisol level before and after treatment. And this is a single blind prospective randomized controlled study uh, with only uh, 20 
uh, the number of patients is only 20, but they all have chronic neuropathic pain. So the results showed that there was no significant difference in, in the baseline of, in terms of demographic diagnosis or treatment modalities between the two groups. But approximately 50 patients in the treatment group reported that the treatment was effective compared to 30 in the placebo group. Pain score reduction after treatment in the best group was significant with P less than 0 0.05, while it was not significant in the placebo group. Cortisol levels significantly reduced only in the best group after treatment, and we concluded that best group yields reduction in pain severity and, and cortisol levels. So based on the results, it seemed this treatment seemed to be effective for chronic neuropathic pain after a single treatment and may be more effective for a long-term management. The management of chronic pain consists of five treatment approaches according to McEntee in Pain Therapy 2020. And the treatment has to be individualized, multimodal, multidisciplinary pain management. And the five treatment include medications such as opioid and non-opioid, restorative therapies, interventional procedures, behavioral approaches, and complementary and integrative health. Opioid for the cancer patients. In 2015, almost 50 million individuals in low-income and middle-income countries experienced suffering uh, related to uh, related to life-threatening or fatal conditions, but they had limited access to palliative care or oral morphine for pain relief. In 2016, we did a study about the availability of and the prescription of opioid for cancer patients in Southeast Asia and found the same. However, by 2019, the emergence of a new pain movement focusing on the under-treatment of pain, influenced by pharmaceutical industry, led to liberalization of multiple existing narcotics regulations and contributed to the escalation in prescription of opioid use, abuse, and overdose-related death near the end of the century. So the challenge for any country now looking to improve pain control and opioid access is actually to prevent an opioid epidemic. There are five point strategies to combat the opioid crisis, which include uh, better treatment for drug addiction, better data on the epidemic, better pain management, and uh, uh, looking at having overdose reversing drugs available all the time, and better research on pain and addiction. This is the CDC recommendations for opioid therapy for chronic non-cancer pain. Another method of treating chronic pain is interventional techniques. And it's one of the commonly utilized modalities of treatments uh, with increasing use and debate in reference to its effectiveness and medical necessity. While there has been increasing util utilization of interventional techniques since 2009, there has been a decline in utilization of overall uh, interventional techniques, specifically epidural injections. And this is due to the availability of so many other uh, uh, treatment modalities. For multidisciplinary pain management programs, it has been shown that patients undergoing a multidisciplinary treatment of chronic pain ut utilize fewer medical services compared to chronic pain patients treated through other approaches, even in countries with uh, national health uh, insurance. And uh, despite uh, a lot of literature supporting the uh, effectiveness of this program and, and the cost effectiveness. In the US, they have seen a number of such programs has steadily decreased in the United States because of um, 
funding. In Malaysia, there's only one full-fledged uh, pain program. That is the one in Selayang Hospital called Menang Program. Another new challenges uh, in pain medicine include the effect of COVID-19 pandemic on the pain medicine specialty. There is growing evidence that COVID-19 is associated with myalgia, referred pain, and widespread hyperalgesia. So chronic pain can be a part of a post-viral syndrome or the results of virus-associated organ damage. Evidence that telemedicine can help to provide ongoing services to chronic pain patients is accumulating, especially in the current COVID-19 pandemic. And telemedicine may be beneficial uh, in maintaining contact with patients and continuing therapy. In conclusion, there has been an incremental progress in a number of areas in the field of pain medicine over the last four decades. Advances, advances in information technology allowing, allow us to interrogate large clinical data sets effectively to improve understanding at a population level. Improvement in our understanding of individual mechanism may take us a step closer to personalized medicine in the field of chronic pain. A further area that we must consider is how we address the problem at the global level, developing simple and effective solutions that can be used in resource poor areas. The opioid crisis and COVID-19 pandemic have taught us lessons that we should consider moving forward. The challenge for any country looking for improved pain control and opioid access is to prevent an opioid epidemic. And telemedicine may be beneficial in maintaining contacts with patients and continuing therapy. Future research and ad advocacy efforts uh, should be, uh, will be necessary to show the benefit of multidisciplinary clinics and multimodal approaches to the management of chronic pain in order to improve the quality of life and provide appropriate access to effective modalities of treatments focusing on non-opioid therapy. So for the students, I have some uh, takeaway messages. Uh, this is from my experience of being the head of department for 11 years and I've seen uh, I've celebrated uh, many good occasions uh, with the master student, but I also shared their darkest moment. That is when they fail the professional exams. So there are many reasons why postgraduate students fail their exam, but I can divide it into three main categories, which is wrong priorities, poor time management, and poor foundation. And poor foundation is the saddest part because they could be the most competent and obliging anesthesiologist, but they could not pass the written examination because poor basic science knowledge, poor critical thinking, and lack of reading skills. So my advice to students is to read, read, and read widely. And the skills of reading is invaluable because the book is our teacher. Reading can take you to the past, to the future, and help us see things in different perspectives. And once you are up there, be kind, be kind, and be kind, and don't forget to give back to society and help others to come up as well. With that, I would like to say thank you to the following. First and foremost, my gratitude to God Almighty. And I would also like to acknowledge the help of Puan Sujitra Devi and Encik Muhammad Faiz for without them, this lecture is not possible. And I would also like to express my great appreciation to the Department of Anesthesiology and the team from the Dean's Office uh, who has helped me to prepare for this occasion. I'd like to thank my parents, Encik Manso Ismail and Puan Kamaria Yaakob for making my life stress-free, for not expecting anything out of me, but have given me their all and for teaching me to be grateful with whatever I have in life, which is a powerful tool for happiness. 
I would like also to thank my husband and children uh, for their inspiration and my reason to live. And also to University of Malaya for enabling me to profess. Vice Chancellors, Deans of Medical Faculty, Directors of UMMC, MD and CEO of UMMC, professors, colleagues, nurses, paramedics and students, and also like to thank the various societies association that I'm a member. And also I would like to thank my siblings and my in-laws for their support. And before I end, I would like to leave you with some pictures that I hope to always remember us this way. With that, I thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Mazida, for the thought-provoking and astonishing lecture. I can see that undivided attention given by all the audiences. Thank you very much as well. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to call upon our Dean, Yang Berusaha, Professor Dr. April, back to the podium to summarize and conclude the proceeding. Please welcome. If you ever have the opportunity to visit Boston, I would recommend a side trip to the Massachusetts General Hospital where the Ether Dome is. And the Ether Dome uh, is the site of where the first, if not one of the first, uh, uh, utilizations of ether for anesthesia. And this was for neck surgery. There's, there's a nice painting there that actually shows how it took place. And it would be horrifying by today's standards because there was no, um, uh, you know, asepsis. Uh, there was no patient confidentiality. And everyone was just wearing their normal day clothes. Um, uh, but... It was a landmark because of the use of ether to reduce pain in, in surgery. Um, so Professor Mazida has demonstrated in her lecture how far we have come in the management of pain. Um, no longer do we have patients being held down by big burly men you know, to, so that the surgeon could get on with their job. Uh, now we are looking at not just single drug uh, anesthesia, we're looking at multimodal anesthesia. But I think the subjective experience of pain is like a chimera, right? It is multifaceted. Uh, it may involve different things to different people. And this is where academic anesthesiology, where you seek to understand the disease, you seek to understand the mechanisms, and you then research ways in which to overcome the problem, 
this is really what academic anesthesiology is. And Professor Marzida has shown us through her own journey how she has exemplified what it means to be an anesthesiologist in an academic centre. She has not only utilised um, existing knowledge and refined it or, you know, having further refined iterations of the practice, but she has also been able to identify local resources, look around you in this world and look at what nature offers in terms of potential solutions. So she has done this and actually proven through good scientific methodology that this has a place in the control of pain. The final thing that I would say Professor Mazida has demonstrated to us is that it is possible to reinvent yourself even as a medical doctor. She started life um, as a general anaesthetist. She went on to become a cardiac anesthesiologist. And now perhaps in her latest iteration, she is a pain specialist. And I would just like to point out that in the video, uh, Dr. Alan So, who was the hypnotherapist, was actually my batchmate in the Master of Surgery. So he started life um, wanting to be a surgeon and then later found his calling as a hypnotherapist. So yeah, definitely for all of us out there who think, well, I'm a doctor and that's all I can be, you can be whatever you want to be, um, provided you have the knowledge, the skills, and really the gumption to pursue it. So in closing, I would like to just bring us back full circle to the proverb that I mentioned at the beginning, which was, pain is inevitable, but suffering is optional. I hope with the work that Professor Mazida, yourselves, you know, and colleagues uh, in many, many different fields, that we may eventually be able to paraphrase this as, pain is not inevitable, and suffering is a thing of the past. With that, please join me in congratulating Professor Mazida on her inaugural lecture. Thank you, Professor April, for chairing Professor Mazida's inaugural lecture. I would also like to take this opportunity to thank the management of the Faculty of Medicine, members of the Department of Anesthesiology, FOM OSHI team, citizens of University of Malaya, as well as all the distinguished ladies and gentlemen who made the effort to be present here today. Thank you very much. With that, we have reached the end of the lecture. So ladies and gentlemen, um, we have prepared a refreshment at uh, Synapse upstairs at level four, so please help yourself. Uh, but before that, I know we all Malaysians, we do love photo, photo session, right? So we would like to commemorate this memorable moment by having a photo with everyone on this stage, following in the order of importance, okay? So first we would like to welcome Professor Mazida's family and friends to the stage, followed by Professor Mazida's VIP, and also the honorable guests, okay? So for those of you who are rather shy to be on the stage, fret not, you can entice Prof. Mazida to a photo shoot outside this auditorium, okay? And note that FOM backdrop has been set up for this purpose. So once again, thank you very much. Stay safe, Assalamualaikum. <laughs>